of the key complaints in F1 recently is that the cars are too big and too heavy, and that in turn is messing about their ability to do what they need to do, and that is race. Only at a select few corners on a select few tracks do we actually get to see anything that constitutes wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. The first piece of track that comes to mind is Turn 1 at Silverstone all the way up to Luffield. Switchback City I called it because, well I'm original. But how big have they actually got over the years? What size were they back in the 1950s all the way up until now? It's an interesting question and one I thought I would answer for you, because I've got a couple of hours free to make a video. Yeah, I'm in the process of moving. It's many stress, especially when your job revolves around being in front of a computer. So first things first, we have to go back to the beginning, back to the 1950s when Formula 1 as a world championship was in its infancy. You've got cars that were very primitive by today's racing standards. They'd got skinny tyres and engines in the front because the rear engine revolution hadn't begun yet. Cars of this era were allowed supercharged or naturally aspirated engines, and in 1954, Maserati brought the 250F with a 12-cylinder 2.5-litre naturally aspirated engine. This particular example was 4 metres long, about 2 metres wide, and had a wheelbase of about 2.2 metres, while having a weight of 670 kilos. Yeah, I'm using metric for this because it's much easier to work with. Sorry, America. But then, in the early 1960s, things changed. The engine capacities dropped down to 1.5 litres, and if Twitter existed back then, the people in charge would have been accused of ruining Formula 1. Bring back the superchargers, and so on. The car that won the championship in 1963 was the Lotus 25, running on the same skinny tyres but was a much smaller car overall versus what was running before, partly due to the smaller engine capacity. But also, this is Lotus, which along with other British manufacturers had the same ethos. Small engines, and make them lighter than a bag of sugar. Compared to the Maserati, the driver was much more enclosed, even if seatbelts at this time still weren't mandatory. Like I said, the same skinny tyres, but the dimensions have changed. 3.5 meters long, 1.5 meters wide, and a similar wheelbase. 2.3 meters. And as this video progresses, I'll put each car next to the one that came before so you can see how they all compare. So here is the Lotus next to the Maserati. Then 1967 rolls around. Formula One has doubled the engine displacement, well, it did that back in 1966, and the Cosworth DFE arrives to then become the engine to have for the next 10 years. Cars became the fastest they'd ever been, and they also became ticking time bombs as drivers would chance being ejected from the car in a crash instead of burning to death, a fate that Lorenzo Bandini and Joe Schlesser would suffer. Now I've been in a house fire. I got burned. It's not nice. Dying from being burned. Not really something you want to think about. In this period, the tyres were still the last forever kind, especially if your name is Jim Clark, but they now have a bigger contact patch through being wider and less rounded. And because of the bigger engines, the cars got longer, and the bigger fuel tanks added to that as well. In terms of safety, these things were still in their infancy with that kind of thing, but in 1966, cars were required to have cockpits designed for easy evacuation. They also had to have extinguishers, circuit breakers, and an oil catch tank that would have added to any length and bulk. But as you can see here, the 49 and 25 have a similar wheelbase while the 49 has a longer nose, all of this being a bit longer to try and protect the driver's feet in an accident, even if the feet are still in front of the suspension. The 49 became 4 metres long with a 2.5 metre wheelbase and was 1.8 metres wide. So from there, we go on to the mid-1970s. Aero is now a key part of the car's design and the side-mounted radiators pioneered by Lotus have become a design staple. Big, fat, slick tyres are now on the cars, and the minimum weight has been bumped up to 530 kilos. Again, like with the 49 we just looked at, these things would have contributed to any bulk, especially as the minimum weight went up from 530 to 550 in 1972. In 1976, more work was done to protect the driver's feet in an accident and this became a defined part of the rulebook. But, despite it looking bigger than the 49, the dimensions are, well, similar. 4.1 metres long, 2 metres wide and a 2.5 metre wheelbase with a 1.5 metre track. It's just bulkier thanks to the radiators, airbox and the wings. And it's a similar story with the ground effect cars too. Take things forward another 10 years or so and the mid-1980s are here and we have the turbocharged monsters. 1200 horsepower in qualifying trim in some cases, engines good for 10 miles or so before being chucked in the bin, and enough turbo lag that you've got enough time to stick the kettle on before that all kicks in. By this time the engines had shrunk to 1.5 litres again, but had whopping great big turbos attached to them, and the massive fuel tank required to get the car to the end of a race meant that the car had to be a bit longer, 
On top of things like the aero advancements and safety parts, as in the early 1980s the carbon fibre safety cell became a thing on the McLaren MP4-1. The minimum weight was now up to 575 kilos and the cars had a 195 litre fuel tank by 1986, which was 220 in 1984. By 1985 the FIA introduced frontal crash testing and in 1987 the rules were changed regarding the driver's feet following the career ending shunt of Jacques Lafitte at Brands Hatch. The driver's feet now had to be behind the front axle and then that bit reinforced which would have contributed to a longer car. But even then this 98T is only marginally bigger in dimensions to the 312. Four and a half meters long, two meters wide and with a 2.7 meter wheelbase. It also had a 1.8 meter track. This became 2 meters at the start of the 90s and then got shrunk again for the narrow track era of the late 90s. So to get into that we'll look at the last of those wide track cars from 1997. This is at a time when the FIA had been through the knee jerk safety reaction to the deaths of Senna and Ratzenberger and had implemented a few more safety things on the cars. Cockpit data recorders were brought in. Cockpits were made wider and longer with the chassis having to be an extra 30 centimeters longer for the driver's feet but because refueling was allowed again the fuel tanks could be smaller and this reduced overall size. Now this bit you'll need to take with a pinch of salt because everywhere says that the FW19 was shorter than the 98T but clearly not. But even with that said the wheelbase is only ever so slightly longer. Unless the models are off but this isn't supposed to be super accurate anyway. In the mid 2000s the cars are still small by modern standards but the dimensions start to get a bit more bloated if that makes any sense. The Ferrari F2004 has grown a bit versus the Williams, back up to that length of 4.5 metres and has a 3 metre wheelbase. Looking at pictures it looks like the cars of that late V10 era got longer and lower versus what was around at the tail end of the 90s. Things will also have changed in regards to the crash structures, this will have contributed to the length as the rear overhang was increased to 60 centimetres, as well as the minimum weight reaching 600 kilos. Then in 2009 all of this was scrapped for the narrow rear wing formula with the cars gaining some extra length and weight in 2010 thanks to the ban on in-race refuelling and also the introduction of the KERS system. In the mid 2010s the hybrid era arrived but it seems that the cars didn't differ that much in size given that the fuel tank shrunk for the 2014 season. On your screen I've put the RSS 2013 car which is based off that year's Red Bull next to the 2015 Williams. The Williams isn't that much longer than the Red Bull though, it's that they don't look that way because the Red Bull's front wing is further back and the nose extends over it. The wheelbase will be different though naturally and the Williams is heavier at 700 kilos, around 100 up on the Ferrari. Crazy. In 2017 though things got bigger still as F1 went to the wide boy spec of car with much more aggressive styling as the 2014 to 2016 cars weren't exactly lookers. The 1998 track rules were reversed and the cars were back to being 2 meters wide with these big fat tyres that added to the weight and everything just got bigger. The minimum weight going up to 728 kilos to accommodate these big fat tyres and big fat cars. As such by 2020 these cars were simultaneously the biggest and fastest they'd ever been. The Mercedes W10 had a 3.6 meter wheelbase and was well over 5 meters long. Compare that to the Lotus 25. It's an aircraft carrier versus a canoe. When the halo was added in 2018 this would have also added to the weight of the car and extra parts of the survival cell and crash structure would also contribute. But still the W10 of 2020 was 743 kilos so not that bad considering. But you'd still wonder how rapid it would have been and looked if it was smaller like the 2007 cars, you know with that same amount of mental aero. And now to the present day, the ground effect cars still over 5 meters long, still about a 3.6 meter wheelbase, but the FIA keeps on jacking up that minimum weight. It now sits at 798 kilos, 50 up on the 2020 cars and over 200 heavier than the Lotus 49 we looked at. And this has been bumped up because of things like the tyres, the amount of mandatory computers wedged in there and also the crash test structures for side and front impacts. And that 798 kilo limit is not like the others I've mentioned. Those other ones were car, driver and fuel. This is just car and driver without fuel. So whack in over 100 litres for the race start and yeah. I mean the halo by itself is 7 kilos. But here is all the cars I've looked at lined up next to each other. Getting bigger and bulkier every time. Now there are plans with the 2026 regulations to try and make them smaller again as bits have been taken off the engines but I wouldn't hold out for much hope. This is the FIA we're talking about. 
So then, a look at how the cars have evolved from simple death traps to big, honking, heavy, lumpy technological masterpieces. If this has made you think things, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more stuff like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Massive thanks to the people of Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help support me on a more personal level, there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces. Or the super thanks if you just want to buy me a coffee or a beer. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.